summertime. All of your vacations have been canceled. All you want to do is go to the lake, go to the river, or go to the beach. The problem is you don't have a place over there. The problem is will Airbnb rent to you? The problem is are there any hotels left? You are tuned in to the Loan Officer Podcast. I am Dustin Owen. Along with me is John Coleman. My main man, my right hand, the producer extraordinaire, that is John Coleman. And today, John, let's jump into owning a vacation home, also known as owning a second home. Let's do it. Now, too many times, home buyers think owning a second home means that they're owning their second home. Meaning, hey, I bought my first house five years ago, now I want to buy my second house. That's correct. Eh, when we think of a second home, we're thinking of a vacation home. Okay. okay. Not a rental property, although you very well may choose to rent out the home, mm -hmm. you're not buying it solely for rental purposes. Okay. And that's probably the main difference between an investment property and a vacation home or what we call in the mortgage industry a second home okay. is the intention of the home owner. But this is the time of year. We, we're coming off a of Memorial Day weekend. Uh, kids are finishing up school, and we do have an extra special curveball thrown at us in 2020 called COVID-19. And most of us that tend to vacation outside of um, going up to the mountains or going to the beach or, um, well, hell, vacations are canceled, right? Yeah. I mean, there, the there, there are no vacations, but... You know, there are definitely things that can be done to get away from your everyday life, to get away from your house, to get away from your office, to get away from your workplace. And when we start doing this as people, we start wondering, well, man, wouldn't it be awesome to own here? Yes. Yeah. A lot of people think that way. So what I want to do is spend the next 20 minutes kind of going back and forth, pros and cons of why someone may want to own a vacation property, why it's um, maybe a good idea on paper, but in, in reality, not so much, um, and, and understand uh, to each is their own. So first and foremost, what we're getting into is the difference, right? We all know what our primary home is. Our primary home is the home that we live in day to day. An investment property is a property that we have no intention of ever staying in, right? I bought a home, I remodeled it just so I could rent it out, maybe two years, three year leases, annual leases, but I have no intention of ever living in this home myself. And usually this home is not in a destination location. And usually this home is not within 50 miles of my primary residence. Okay. Because something that's that's crucial to know from a financing standpoint, when you go to your bank or your lender and you're trying to obtain a home loan for a vacation or second home purchase, they're going to mandate two things. The home needs to be either 50 miles away from your current primary residence okay. or destination location. So let me give you two examples. Let's say I run a business and my business um, is in two markets. I'm in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm also in Orlando, Florida. And my business requires me to split my time equally between those two markets, meaning I physically need to be there. Well, it's very plausible for me to own a secondary residence in Jacksonville, as well as a primary residence in Orlando, because A, Jacksonville to Orlando is greater than 50 miles away. And B, I'm personally going to be utilizing that home as a secondary residence. Um, same thing can be said if I do business in New York City, but I prefer to reside in Orlando, right? So that, that's, a, that's a pretty simple use for a secondary residence. And I'm also 50 miles away. Yep. Now, my home to, let's say, New Smyrna Beach. New Smyrna Beach is the beach of locals here in Central Florida. Uh, tourists go to Daytona Beach. Locals tend to go to New Smyrna Beach. Or if you live further south, you may go to Cocoa Beach. And that's for those, those of us in Orlando. We start getting more towards western central Florida. You start going to like Clearwater Beach and St. Pete Beach and Indian Rocks Beach on the west coast versus east coast. But I digress. I can buy a home in New Smyrna, although my house to New Smyrna Beach is only 38 miles because... Is the beach a destination location? Yes. Yes. No different than if I wanted to 
by a secondary resident that was maybe 30 minutes away from my primary residence, but it was in the mountains or it was on a lake or it was on a river. What constitutes being a destination location? Like it sounds like the beach, somewhere nice, somewhere scenic. Is it a touristy area? Okay. Is it a place that people want to go and reside? Okay. Like an argument can be made if I bought a home on Disney property. Is Disney property a destination location? Yeah. Do I want to, on an annual basis, maybe even semi-annual basis, maybe even monthly like my buddy Andy does with his family. Andy lives in Virginia, and they come to Orlando almost monthly hmm. to go to Disney. Um. One could state that, yes, Disney, the attractions here in Central Florida would be deemed a destination location. But it's, it's typically that. Okay. A place you would go to get away from um, your your suburban uh, planned unit development lifestyle. Gotcha. Condo at the beach, cabin on uh, in the mountain, cabin at the, at the river or on the lake. Okay. That would be a destination location. So all this can be done. And all this can be done from a financing standpoint with as little as 10% down. But that is something that is crucial for anyone who is interested in buying a vacation home, which this is the time that this is going to happen. You're going to go on vacation. You and your spouse are going to fall in love with wherever you are. You're going to have the most magical time and be like, oh, we should buy here. Okay, well, wh what does that look like? What does it look like to buy? First and foremost, in order to finance that purchase, it's going to be 10% down, minimum. Um, now at 10% down, you're going to be struggling with, well, do you pay private mortgage insurance or do you qualify for a loan that doesn't require private mortgage insurance? So without getting into all that, just know it's 10% down. Also know that when you go to qualify, you have to qualify with whatever your current home's payment is, plus the payment of this new property. So you have to be able to qualify with basically two monthly mortgage payments. Now, just because it's a vacation home does not mean that you cannot rent it. You can rent it, but when you buy something as a vacation home, you're basically stating that you are going to personally use this property at a minimum two weeks out of the year. Mm, okay. So you can't buy it and rent it 365, 24-7, right? If you do so, that's an investment property. Now you're, buying, you know, now you're following investment property guidelines, which are way different than a second home or a vacation home guidelines. Now, I talked about qualifying. Now, you and your spouse also want to budget because you may very well sit back and say, yeah, I know that in order to qualify for the financing, I have to qualify with the primary, with my primary housing payment plus this new housing payment, as well as all my other debts, things like student loans and car payments and credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. But I do plan on renting it, right? Maybe it's a condo at the beach and I plan on renting it January through March to snowbirds. Maybe I plan on renting it every other week in the summer. I want to use it my two weeks. Maybe I want to use it one week in June, one week in July, but the rest of the time I do want to uh, rent it out and you definitely can. And you definitely want to work that into your personal budget because personal budget is going to differ than, than, than how you have to qualify, right? We do this all day long at Waterstone Mortgage where we do consultations with home buyers and we tell them up front, look, I'm going to be able to qualify you for more home than you want to afford. So it's less about how much I can qualify you for. It's more about what are you comfortable with? Same thing is going to apply on a second home, but it's probably going to work uh, in reverse. It's going to be, hey, I can qualify you this, for this, but let's make sure you're going to be comfortable with it. And, and you're going to walk through the, the financing of, or not in the financing, but the, the overall total budget in terms of I can rent it this many weeks for this much money. It's going to cost me X amount of dollars in upkeep, X amount of dollars in association dues, et cetera. And whether or not someone buys a vacation property or not is 100% a personal preference. No different than whether or not somebody rents it is going to be a personal preference. I'm one to state if you have to rent it for it to make sense for you on a budgeting standpoint, take a really hard look at this decision. Now, I'm not saying don't do it. Just take a really hard look and maybe you'll decide you want to personally have more reserve assets than the person who doesn't need to rent it in order to be able to absorb the full payment of this vacation property. Also, when you run your numbers, you have to A, factor in things like vacancy, 
but you have to factor in also things like repairs. I mean, if it's a single family home, it's going to break. The AC is going to need to be fixed. The, the roof is going to leak. If it's a condo, at some point, you're going to have what are called condo assessments. And I have friends right now that are dealing with a true story, $75,000 condo assessment. Please digress. Yeah, 75. So they bought a condo. These condos were built in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. Okay. The condo needs a, the condo, the condominium, the project, the, the, the building needs a complete overhaul. Well, when you're one of the owners, you have to come up with your share of what it means for a for a total seventy five grand. So you this condo may be worth somewhere between four hundred and six hundred thousand dollars, and you're talking about fifteen percent of. So those are things that you just need to factor in and budget in. Like like, could you come up with that seventy five grand? If it's an AC, could you come up with six or eight thousand dollars worth of worth of uh, well money yeah. Yeah. <laughs> money for for a, a brand new ac wow. but then when you're also running the numbers how much do you love going to this one city yeah. this one beach this one lake that this one mountain for some people that is their jam that's what they want to do it's like i love blairsville georgia that's i have memories i have lineage i i have i i don't want to go anywhere else when, when, when I get time off, I want to drive to Blairsville. Okay. Awesome. Nice. For that person, maybe they want to buy a cabin in Blairsville. Mm -hmm. For other people, and I'm probably more in this category, I love Blairsville. That's actually where I proposed to my wife. But I want to check out Charleston, and I also want to check out Maine, and I also want to go to Colorado, and I also would like to go to um, Havasu Falls, you're buying a lot of investment vacation properties. Yeah, right. So I'm not. So I'm not. And, and and when I start running the numbers for owning a vacation property and not renting it, I can get real geeky with math, right? So I ran these numbers once about buying a condo at New Smyrna Beach. And I understand that um, my condo should appreciate on average two and a half to three and a half percent annually. So if I bought something for $500,000, that condo is going to go up on average approximately twelve to twenty thousand dollars a year in value. I also know that the payments I make on that condo are some of them are going to go towards paying down a loan. That's principal reduction. That's my money that I'm saving. So even though I put fifty thousand dollars down, and even though I pay three thousand dollars a month, I'm not really out of pocket the full $36,000 and the full $50,000 because I have some things going towards principal. Some of my cost is being offset by appreciation. But what I had to figure out is that condo purchase, if I don't rent it, it was a $30,000 a year luxury item. Damn. Now, now that's $30,000 to state on a random Friday afternoon, my wife could say, Hey, let's go have dinner at the garlic in new Smyrna. And let's stay the weekend. The weather looks great and the kids don't have a whole lot going on. Yeah. That's a luxury because for that to happen any other way, I'd have to, A, make sure I could find a rental over there. I'd have to pay the $500. It wouldn't be my own. It'd probably be some Marriott property or some Airbnb. Um, I'd have to pack more stuff because if I owned already over there, I'd have a yeah. set of clothes and I'd already have the boogie boards and the surfboard could, and the yeah. chairs. You could just hop in your car, just dressed as is, really, and just go over there. Yeah, just, yeah. And how awesome would that be? Yeah. Amazing. But it's a $30,000 a year luxury. That being said, would you, is there a certain point in your life that you would advise someone looking into a vacation party? Let's say you own a home. Like, is there a certain point in the home ownership process? Like, you're 50, you're halfway there paying down your mortgage. You're 75% of the way there. You're 25%. Is there a certain time period that you would advise, like, hey, this is a good time for you to think about buying a vacation home rather than, you know, instead of taking on the burden of a second mortgage if you're barely paying off your first? I don't think there's ever a certain time in life or in, in your um, cycle of being a homeowner. Okay. I think it's one of those, if it makes sense, it makes sense. The, the purpose of today is I kind of want to lay out the thought process so people can try to figure out, does it make sense for them or not? Um, are they thinking it all through? Because a lot of times we can go on vacation and we can get caught up in the hype. Yeah. And you know, the hype's for real. And, and I have a lot of friends who love 
their beach condo. They love their home in the mountains. They love their, their place on the river. Um, but is it for everybody? I'm sitting here saying no, cause it's not for me, yeah. but it doesn't mean it's not for them. And it's, and it's not also that I, my wife and I don't dream about owning a beach condo cause we do. Um, I just haven't been able to pull the trigger. I haven't been able to find enough of, um, uh, internal evidence that it's like, yeah, go ahead and pull, pull the trigger. Because when I start running the numbers, I don't know if spending $30,000 a year is on that luxury item is, is what I'm ready to do. Cause I, if I had $30,000, that's a lot of money. That's a, you know, it's like, if I, even if I had the $30,000, would I rather use it by taking two or three really awesome vacations to, Literally, you name it. Maybe I want to go watch the Jaguars play a game in London. Maybe we go to London. Maybe I want to go skiing. Maybe I want to go to Alaska. Maybe I want to go to a dude ranch. Maybe I, it's like, maybe I'd rather do a bunch of other things than, than just be able to, on a whim, pick up and drive an hour to the coast and stay in a place that's my own. Yeah. Now, that being said, what if I did rent it? Right? What if I did rent it? And now I know that I can rent it enough that it's paying for itself. And maybe my, my financial outlay is basically what I would have paid spending the money on the Marriott hotel room or on the Airbnb. Yeah, but then when I rent it, I now have strangers using it. I, you know, maybe the wear and tear goes up. Maybe someone breaks it yeah. or th the worst part is that when people buy these vacation homes, well, their friends and family want to hook up. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, hook me up. Hey, are you? Are you, hey, are you going to be out there this weekend? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, look, are are you going to tell your mom and dad that they can't go to your beach condo? Absolutely not. Okay, but when they go over there, do you know what they're going to do? Go through every single cabinet drawer, rearrange. What is this doing here? Oh, are they? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, you, you're as well. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking more financially. You know what they're going to do? Oh. They're going to wash their clothes. Oh. They're going to turn on the the power. They're going to run water. Um, run up that bill. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you don't think about this, but you let your best friend and, and his family use it for a long weekend. You let your parents go over there for a week. Now you haven't used it, but all of a sudden you see that your utility bill is triple. I just thought of this when you mentioned that. It's like, oh, you want to go over there? Yeah. You want some cable? Okay. Maybe not cable. You want some Wi-Fi? That's a monthly expense. Yeah. Keep that up. You can't Cr switch it on and off. Well, and, and that is something to think about as well. Yeah. Is that, you know, it, it's, it's more than just the payment. It's the payment yep. plus the taxes, plus the insurance, plus the association dues. If we're talking about a condo plus utilities. Now, sometimes association dues at a condominium project will include some of your utilities. Maybe yep. your water and your cables included. Um, but it's still things you have to factor in. And again, to some, I mean, I, I, I can rattle off my buddy, Chris, my buddy art, like they love their condo. Mm -hmm. They just do. Um, and, and they have figured out to where their condo has paid for itself year in year out. But when you do that, when you rent out your condo at the beach or your place on the river, you're also losing some of that flexibility of, oh, I want to run over there this weekend. Oh, well, you can't. It's being rented. Um, so it's just, you know, that, that that's all food for thought for someone who's looking at doing it. And look, I, I mean, I'm in the living of financing second homes and condos, so I don't want anyone to think that it's a bad decision because it's not. Just make the decision for what it is. It's a bit of a luxury item. It can be um, an investment, but when you purchase it, you shouldn't be purchasing it for investment purposes. You should be purchasing it because it's a lifestyle choice, because it's a luxury item. Now, it could be a luxury item that, again, you work out financially that it will benefit you long term. Like what if for 25, 30 years, you're able to own this vacation home, it paid for itself, and now you find yourself fully retired. And not only do you own your primary home, but you own the secondary home, both outright. And now... What do you want to do? You can sell it. Yeah. Heck, you could sell your primary plus this vacation home 
and then just go buy the best Mac Daddy home that suits all of your needs. Maybe it's in a destination location, but it's a house and not a condo, and it's on a better waterway with a better view in a bigger city. So, you know, there's definitely ways that it makes sense. I just think going into it, people should understand the pros and the cons and weigh them for themselves. And then from a practical standpoint, understand minimum 10% down. When you sit down and do your budget, if you have to rely on renting it partially to afford it, then make sure that you are in a very strong financial position. When I say that, make sure you have enough reserve assets because ultimately, like anything in life, we are going to not think of certain things and certain expenses. You're going to think you can rent it for longer than you can, and then something like COVID happens. You're going to think that it's going to cost you X per year, and then maybe your condo hits you with an assessment, or maybe you have a roof leak, or maybe you have an appliance go down. So if you're buying it and you don't need to rent it, then understand it's a luxury item. And then look at the cost of that luxury item and ask yourself, would I rather spend my additional leftover money on this one luxury item, or are there better luxury items out there for me? Um, but it, it definitely is pretty freaking awesome. And I am jealous of my friends who can say, Hey, we're going to go to the beach for the week. I can't say that. Hey, we're going to go to the beach for the weekend. I can't even say that. I can say, Hey, I want to go to the beach for the weekend. Crap. Let me go online to see if there's any, you know, these people don't have to do that. And what, what an amazing experience. Um, plus, you know, you go to a place and, and it's not clean the way you want it. It's not decorated the way you want it. The bed sucks. Um, the shower head's not the type of shower head you want. When you own a place, oh, yeah. make it your own. you can make it your own. You just have to make sure you really love going to that one particular place. And if that's you, man, a vacation home is for you. And here's the best thing about it. Maybe you do it and you do it for two or three years and you find out it wasn't for you. At least you can say you've done it. And now you know which side of the aisle to sit on. But that is owning a vacation home 101. Can you think of anything that we might have left off for uh, someone who's contemplating owning an investment property? Or not, not an investment property. That's a whole nother show. Correct. Owning a vacation home, also known as a secondary residence. I do have one question. If you own a vacation property, are there any sort of tax write-offs, refunds, any sort of incentives that would help? Eight, like cost anything you can get back that would be like a kickback that exists or no? Not that I'm aware of. Now I'm not a CPA, um, not an accountant. I know a couple of them, but I would definitely defer to a CPA um, because you are going to have this property show up on your Schedule E. Obviously, Schedule E on your on your 1040 tax return. Um, obviously, if you do choose to rent it, my understanding of the of the IRS tax code is you do have to claim that as income then I'm sure you have certain expenses that you can offset against the income. Um, but I don't know if there's any additional tax write-offs because it's not your primary home. Um, but you know, I do know if you rent it, you will have to claim income on, uh, on that rent. And I do know that overall, owning real estate is a pretty darn good investment long-term, especially when it comes to the creation of wealth. So buying multiple properties that you're going to use and that you're going to use properly can very well lead to someone becoming much wealthier later in life than if you don't. So there are definitely some benefits that want to be um, dug into, that want to be analyzed, that want to be thought out when it comes to it. But at the same time, don't make any rash decisions. Make sure it fits into your overall financial picture and make sure it's, it's going to make sense for you. And if you have any further questions, I'd be more than happy to help uh, anyone walk through the pros and cons. Um, I can even walk you through how I made the decision not to pull the trigger. But by the way, I'm still on an MLS search because I kind of still want to do it. Um, and then we can also talk about qualifying. And, and are you ready financially? Like, are you set up financially both in terms of your career 
and your job situation and your income and your reserve assets and your other debts. And I mean, we, we can talk about leveraging equity in your primary home to come up with the 20% or 10% down payment for your secondary residence. I mean, there, there are definitely some ways that we can make this happen as long as it makes financially financial sense sure. to the potential homeowner. But now is the time people are going to go away and they're going to rent a place and they're going to think, how awesome would it be if we owned? And why do I know that? Because I do that every time I go on vacation. I thought it'd, it's, oh, it'd be great to own something at Beaver Creek. It'd be great to own something in the mountains in Tennessee. It'd be great to own something in New Smyrna Beach. Hey, if you want to look into it, give me a call. I would be more than happy to spend 15, 20 minutes helping you brainstorm what's best for you. And if you want to get a hold of me, the office number is 407 645 6363. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, the loan officer podcast. You can find John Coleman just by Googling his name. And, um, you know, if you ever want to email me, I, I use my Waterstone work email for just about everything. And that is D Owen at waterstonemortgage.com. He's John Coleman. I'm Dustin Owen. You just finished listening to the loan officer podcast. We appreciate you share us, like us, tell everyone about us. Peace.